Thank you for joining us here today for this important discussion. Um, in my life away from Art Basel Hong Kong, from Curating Encounters, I am the director of a 30-year-old government-funded not-for-profit contemporary art centre in Sydney, Australia called Artspace. We secure our resources to develop our program through a mixture of both state and federal funding in Australia. And in recent years, there's been an increased obligation to diversify sources of revenue and to think through strategies for ways that we can self-generate alternate and parallel um, opportunities for investing in our program. In Australia, there's been extensive discussion over the past 10 years about developing capacity in the small to medium sector and what that looks like and how do we create the platforms and structures that will ensure sustainability, but also invest in risk experimentation and critical ideas across the presentation and production of contemporary art, not just for institutions, but also directly to artists. In that way, um, I actually interestingly met Adeline Uy, the director of Art Basel Asia in 2006 when I was working on a project in Malaysia called the Independence Project, looking at independent practices, independent spaces, and the politics of independence, and how within complicated structures of inequitable funding and unreliable resourcing, how we could invest in independence with a true commitment to risk. So Adeline and I had begun a conversation some 10 years ago about funding and its implications on independence and capacity for experimentation. And she said to me, you know, it would be fantastic, Stephanie and, um, and Adeline had spoken about a panel looking at funding and across the Asia Pacific, the fact that there are not really commensurate platforms in any particular place or context across government or the private sector to demarcate particular standards or benchmarks for ways in which funding is developed or invested or delivered. And so we wanted to have a conversation with three speakers who represented a diversity of perspectives on the landscape and could present a very you know, strong set of arguments for ways that particular contexts are thinking laterally and responsively about how to be agile in an environment where we all know that increasingly resources are limited, um, investment is reducing from, from government and from public sources, and how we work strategically and intelligently and with lateral capacity to invest in new platforms for diversification and self-generating revenue to invest back in practice. In that way, she said to me, would I be happy to um, speak with Rupert Meyer, the chairman of the Australia Council for the Arts and one of the key funders for art space in Australia. And I like Rupert very much, so I said yes. And Rupert said yes to participating. We also invited uh, Merva, who's representing Saha in Turkey. And um, she's one of the founding directors and Artspace recently invited four curators from Turkey to Australia to develop new projects for the year of Turkey and Australia exchange. So this is a conversation we've been having and Sahar is an interesting comparison. And Cosman Kostanas is director of Parasite in Hong Kong, a very, you know, a good kind of peer platform for Artspace and someone with whom we share a lot of commonality. So the way we're going to approach this today is I've asked the speakers to speak openly, not about the kind of party line. You can look online to find out the structures and codes and ways in which they, um, you know, the ways in which they share and uh, and the ways in which you can apply for funding from various contexts. This is not a panel about how to get funding or how to make money. This is a panel about what does strategic thinking look like around diversification of revenue from both public and private sources in the 21st century. And Rupert Meyer, I'll begin by saying, Rupert has several hats, but the two main ones are as the chair of the Meyer Foundation, um, that is for you are chair at the moment, or you're not, not, chair, you're not exactly chair at the moment, but you're on the board. <laughs> you should be chair at the board. The Meyer Foundation is the family foundation um, that was established through Sydney Meyer. And the objectives and aims of the Meyer Foundation are to act bigger, adapt better, and strengthen family engagement. They have a commitment as a family who are investing in not only culture, but also health, education, and other areas of social investment, into thinking about how critical programs across the arts and humanities, education, poverty and disadvantage, and sustainability in the environment can have most effect. The other hat he wears is actually really important in terms of 
the environment that I work within. In 2002, uh, Rupert was commissioned to write something called the Maya Report. And as a consequence of this report that was commissioned by federal government, he wrote a paper called the Visual Arts and Crafts Strategy, which completely altered the small to medium sector in Australia and saw an investment of significant funds into supporting sustainability at an operational level, which was radical. It wasn't about programming, it was about organizations building capacity. And it was the recommendations that Rupert made that completely altered the landscape for that sector, which is really the incubator for developing new work. He's currently the chair of the Australia Council for the Visual Arts, and in that role he has the responsibility of liaising with federal government to deliver a set of key objectives across areas that include, and are not limited to, I will say, <laughs> uh, the Australia Council's objectives at the moment are um, basic, hang on, I've got the quote here, just sorry, pardon me for a moment. Basically, the Australia Council works across art form boards to invest in capacity and development by investing directly in practitioners and also organisations. The Australia Council delivered a strategic plan two years ago, which was to deliver, to deliver a culturally ambitious Australia. And as a subsequent response to that strategic plan, there has been some changes in the funding landscape in Australia. So I will now hand over to Rupert to speak to the context that he occupies. Great. Well, look, th thanks very much, Alexi, and uh, good evening, everyone, and fellow panellists, and congratulations to you on your Encounters um, exhibition here. Um, uh, Alexi wanted to sort of have, have us all talk about what it feels like, um, which is a really interesting sort of way in to talk about some of the issues in, in funding. And I, I suppose, being someone who's involved in um, public funds and also private funds, I've been thinking what it feels like to turn up uh, uh, for, a, um, uh, for a day at the Australia Council versus uh, a day at the um, Foundation. I think that's the sort of thing that, that you, you had in mind. Uh, I mean, I should say um, I have a spring in my step for both. Um, and it's a very great privilege to be involved in, in both the, the allocation and distribution of public funding as well as private funding. Um, and I say it's a privilege because in the public funding situation, um, there's a huge trust relationship that exists between the public sector and the arts sector. Um, the Australia Council um, uh, is simultaneously of government and of the sector. Um, which is sometimes quite an awkward place to be, um, as it proved last year with some of the changes to the funding arrangements, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but it, it, it is the nature of that, that trust relationship which is, which is really significant. And of course, um, as a public body, it really exists to um, make grants um, and play a non-grant making role in supporting the arts in Australia. That's what it exists for. In philanthropy land, on the other hand, um, there's, um, I also have a spring in my step, and there's also a great sense of, of privilege in being able to you know, be engaged in a process of, uh, of distributing and allocating private funding. But it's an entirely different context. Um, uh, the fund and the foundation, the, the, the My Foundation, can actually change its focus areas at any time. It's not obligated in any particular way to, a, to an art form or a, uh, any other um, uh, medical research or, or education. So, as, as we think about the um, uh, as we think about the, the entire universe, um, uh, it's a deliberate choice to be involved directly in funding arts and imagining the way in which we might um, do that. Um, I, I guess you know one of the issues at the moment is that this is one of the, the most um, dynamic sectors. Uh, uh, it's constantly changing, and therefore uh, both organisations and what's common about them is you know the need to be incredibly sort of flexible and adaptable in the way in which they respond to the needs and circumstances of, of the sector. I mean I've talked uh, a little bit about um, the different nature of the organisations, the different levels of responsibility, the different types of governance arrangements, the different sort of, uh, structures that, uh, uh, that exist um, in uh, comparing sort of private and, um, and, and, and public um, giving. The, the challenges, remarkably, are actually quite similar um, for, the, for the two organisations. And I mean, in the Australian context, we have a, a rapidly changing our population 
and you know great diversity and you know it be really begins to sort of beg questions about well you know what responsibility do we have in Australia for funding for example the Western Canon uh, as a as a tradition of funding arts organisations um, you know that's certainly the model by which we've existed over the last uh, um, 50 years as a funding body but in the next 50 years you know how important is it going to be for for Australia to be engaged in funding um, the uh, the maintenance of that canon is distinct from um, other uh, other traditions and uh, uh, multiple art forms that reflect the diversity of the population. I think that's a that's a really interesting um, area to, to to reflect upon. Um, I think there is though an interesting question with that, and you did mm. say to interrupt, which is that the Australia Council has devolved in recent years things like its intra arts boards and its media arts boards, and it has actually recently created a board for opera within the Australia Council. So there is a kind of imperative um, in some ways in Australia to, with particular objectives around particular areas of investment that are tied yeah. with yeah, there's there's no standalone board for, for opera. In fact, one of the things we've done is we've dissolved all of the the boards that previously existed and um, compacted about 150 different funding programs into four different streams that are then peer assessed by uh, 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 peer panels uh, uh, drawing from about 600 or 700 peers from around Australia across art forms, across geographies, across experiences. So we're able to tailor make <coughs> peer panels to assess various uh, uh, projects and submissions as, as, as But it as is they interesting, arrive. I think, for the Australia Council as different priorities arise through government or through other conversations that you're having. having you know, I mean, the establishment of the Australia Council in 1967 was about an arm's length principle for funding culture in Australia, yep. but the landscape changes all the time, which alters the way in which you structure and prioritise funding. Look, it, it, that, that is true, and indeed of our uh, annual allocation of a little less than $200 million, um, almost 60% of it in some way or another is what we would describe as government directed. Mm. So uh, that part of it is, that's peer, peer assessed is a, uh, is a minority part of the overall uh, funding for, for the council. Um, I mean, I guess the, um, um, and you know, last year we did face a, a funding disruption where, you know, part of the um, funding that was uh, um, uh, made available to us that led to the creation of the strategic plan, of a five-year plan, um, some of that funding was redirected to a, to a new fund to be established within another arm of government and that was money that was directed away from the, from the Australia Council and that has had some considerable impact on the discretionary grant making capacity of the, of, of the Council. Um, and that's significant because you know, that mostly impacts the small to medium uh, companies that Alexi has been talking about and individual artist grants. Um, uh, so, you know, dealing with those changes has become a you know, really significant imperative over the, last, uh, over the last couple of months. Happily, some of that money has come, uh, has come back to us, but, uh, but not all of it. And I, go I would just say, I mean, I suppose it's interesting because you are such a dedicated and committed advocate for supporting and investing in independence and the way that support can be directly given to organisations and to artists to build capacity which sits outside of predetermined mm. outcomes and actually enables speculation and enables new forms to take hold and have ambition. And I think, you know, last year out of $45 million that was made available for artist grants in small to medium sector, $25 million was repealed by government to be given to the minister who is going to create a new fund to give that money out with a committee of his own assembled peers, which is an interesting moment in Australia. Look, there, there are a combination of different, different elements of, of that, but yes, there's a, a fund that was set up within the ministry with greater ministerial discretion that had existed um, previously. Um, so look, that, that is so, and it's diminished our capacity to implement the strategic plan on the basis that, uh, uh, that it was, it was uh, in, envisaged. I mean, it, it, broadly, one of the challenges in you know, reflecting um, public institutions as distinct from private institutions is that the, the uncertainties of the government uh, environment and the government framework is something that we have to live with within government land. Um, and uh, that is a reality of the circumstances. The, the, the capacity for organisations like the Australia Council to then act as an advocate um, 
for, for the, the sector uh, is somewhat diminished by appearing to create the sense of enlightened self-interest, or some may even regard it as non-enlightened self-interest. So the manner in which we, we advocate both publicly and privately to government around levels of funding uh, is something that you know, really has to be measured and you know, recognising a, a long-term long uh, uh, commitment in that. In philanthropy land, it's an entirely different set of circumstances. I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. It leads nicely to Saha in a moment. But I think, you know, what did happen last year was that we did see in Australia that, indeed, that idea that the Australia Council was an advocacy agency and the role that you'd played as advocates was really, you know, brought into sharp relief in circumstances where you weren't able to determine, even with the most committed and dedicated mm. of of solidarity and I would argue in Australia that with what happened last year there was a lot of support that rallied around the Australia Council and around your leadership and around the way that the Australia Council rallied to try and regroup to support the sector and I think that bears acknowledgement. Yeah it, it was a, it really was an extraordinary thing to see the way in which the the sector supported the council through that period. I mean I guess also it, it, it does reflect on one of the the non-grant making roles which you've identified is advocacy. Um, I mean in this area in this era, actually, information is advocacy uh, and putting out reliable, timely, comprehensive information about what the circumstances are and what the, what the facts are of a particular set of situations. And then others can run with, uh, uh, with how they, they want to advocate around that. So, you know, we felt it was really important to put out clear inf information around that. Again, it's, uh, it's an entirely different context in, in, the, in the philanthropic sector where, where there isn't that sense of public, public funds and public engagements and it's an entirely different sense of agency that the philanthropic sector has with, with the art sector. And I think that's a really great point and thank you, Rupert, for speaking so frankly. Mm. Um, over to Merva. And, you know, as one of the founding directors, there's nine directors, I believe. With, um, Ten founders. Ten founders, pardon me. Nine founders, one director. <laughs> nine founders, one director, founding director. <laughs> it's, it's getting my numbers right today. It's not a numbers game for me today. <laughs> um, but look, Saha is so remarkable. And whenever I go to Istanbul, and when we bought the four Turkish curators to Australia two years ago with funding from the Australia Council, we bought Mary Spirito, who coordinates the programs for Salon for Art Basel in Miami. November Painter from Salt, Oval de Masulu and Bashak Shinova, all we kept hearing was Saha, 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 Saha. And we kept hearing from those curators that what Saha provided was more than support for the arts in terms of financial <coughs> investment, which was crucial, but what you did provide was advocacy as well and a commitment to supporting, again, risk and experimentation and the work of living artists and institutions to achieve, particularly at an international scale. And the key areas of Saha's program are education, curatorial research and collaborations. And the aim is to contribute to raising the presence and visibility of contemporary art from Turkey and offer its support to artistic projects working in line with this vision. So would you speak for a bit about your position as founding director and the objectives of Saha? Yes, um, we were established in... It's kind of loud, is it? Um, <coughs> so we were established about four and a half years ago. And um, it was... I mean, it basically... Uh, it was established very organically because in Turkey there's no infrastructure for um, supporting contemporary arts through the through the Ministry of Culture or um, or through the government so no government agency and artists would have to I mean previously prior to Saha artists would have to apply to um, individuals to collectors or to people that or to companies that they could approach. Um, to ask for funds if they were if they wanted to if they were invited to participate in an exhibition abroad or um, and it's not always easy to to access collectors of course and some of them can get it some of them can't um, so it's three of the I mean it actually started with three of the founders who were approached um, quite frequently and um, the, the idea was to create a funding body. Um, that would actually be collective, first of all, and that would be considerate of the ethics of giving. Um, so we, um, we fundraise privately, but we operate um, in a manner that is kind of similar to many funding bodies that are um, government agencies. So what we do is um, we fund directly through nonprofit art institutions that, um, that invite artists or curators from Turkey and we collaborate with nonprofit art institutions to create opportunities to enhance 
um, the networks of artists from Turkey. And um, we are funded by, um, at the moment, 87 members, and they, they all contribute the same, which is 5,000 euros a year, um, and it's, it's annual, and it's a growing number of membership. And um, this is how we remain, I mean, because we are collective, um, Saha is, is each one of them, but at the same time we can remain independent and um, free of any agendas of, of, of any government or uh, we don't interfere in the content and we can advocate the artists. Um, I mean, we, we don't ever select artists, so it's the arm's length distance that comes from public studying, public institutions that have been operating for years, um, especially in um, the Western culture. I think actually there's another <coughs> point which is Saha means field. Yeah. And you describe as your mission, we deem it appropriate to focus on the independent film which we aim to create. And you know, that idea of a field, if you can speak more to how you invest in a field. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we operate in uh, three different ways. One is through running applications. So if any institution wants to invite an artist, they can apply with the budget that they have for a new production or, um, or for a curator. And secondly, we, um, we collaborate with institutions. So like Delfina Foundation in London or um, Reichs Academy in, in Holland or um, ISCP. So residency programs for artists and curators. And we create the opportunities that they can go to these programs and at the same time the third function is that we um, invest in the infrastructure in Turkey so we support artist initiatives in Turkey um, for, for their sustainability we call it a sustainability fund and also we support local um, biennials within the country as well as the Istanbul biennial which we consider a, a large-scale um, international exhibition but um, because we are independently funded I think um, we can provide, we have the luxury to provide the rights to fail to, to artists when they produce. We don't ask for anything in return. Um. I think, I mean, there's an interesting thing within your structure, and I suppose the thing with Saha being such a recent kind of coalition, in a sense, is that you have a very strict set of structures around advisory boards, boards of directors, and ways that you manage the ethics of giving and the allocation of the funds that you generate through the partnerships with the private sector. Mm -hmm. And you and I spoke last night a little bit. Um, we caught up last evening and talked a bit about this conversation about how do you operate when you have uncertainty about continuity of investment from the private sector and also how do you manage the ethics of the internal administration and allocation of funding yeah um, um, I mean I think what's really important is that um, from the beginning we wanted to be a um, say democratic but um, a collective funding body so um, a growing number of members, so 87 members, individuals, so 70% of our budget comes from um, individuals, which is which is great because even if a couple of people drop out, it, you still have the budget that you can function with. But at the same time, um, it's collective enough that um, we can still remain independent of any taste of an individual person or, an, uh, or a PR campaign of a, um, or a corporation. We are also supported by four corporations, um, which have been uh, there from the beginning, but they are... Um, they have accepted to um, to support what we our cause, which is which is very necessary in a country like in a geography like Turkey. Um, so they don't interfere. Um, I suppose I would ask two questions, which is, does the um, board of Saha um, reserve the right to turn back funding from organizations or corporations that may have unethical practices or may change their business to present potential conflicts in terms of the ethics of private giving? And do you, some, do you have as one of your aims in the future to obtain funding from government or do you have conversations with government or is it something that you have a mission and statement not to do? Um, first of all, yes, the ethics of uh, giving is very important for us. So um, this is why we don't work, we don't um, choose any artist. Uh, so we don't plan the careers of artists. Um, we work directly with institutions that already have invited artists for projects. Um, this is important for us. And um, the fact that the commitment of the institution um, to the artist and to the project is very important. And the ethics of giving, um, 
we try to create value through our contribution. So it's not about, um, it's, it's not even about the visibility, but it's about enhancing the opportunities that artists um, get in a, um, free of the, free of the pressures of the commercial world or, um, or trying to find um, funding for a, for a project. And secondly, about the government, um, I think we would, prefer to remain independent. This is, um, this is important for us because it also gives us the flexibility to, to maybe change uh, when the environment um, has other needs. So at the moment, Saha provides, I mean, it was organically established um, because it was necessary to create funds for um, artists uh, from Turkey, but uh, we may have to adapt to to other needs, so because that's why we are we are here. So I think it the, this independence comes from being non-governmental. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could, could I? Would you ever say no to a benefactor? Yeah. Um, yes. Well, first of all, um, we from the beginning we did not accept anyone who has a commercial relationship um, because. As I said, democratic. Um, in Saha, everybody contri contributed the, the same, the members are all equal, and they can all be in the board. So the founders are still the board because they, they established the principles and the ethics of funding, and, and Saha, they established the idea. Um, but um, it's also the fact that because we are an association, any member can become elected as a part of the board. So we are able to be flexible in adapting also and changing the charter if necessary. With the principles. Within the course. principles yeah, within of that, principles. of course. Great. Well, I think that's, yeah, it's getting robust. So I think this is a good time to bring the sector into the discussion with Cosman Kostanas, who is the director of Parasite, which is familiar to most of you, founded in 1996 by artists in Hong Kong, Patrick Lee, Leung, Wen, uh, Leung Chu Wu, Phoebe Man, Ching Ying, Sarah Wong, Chi Young. Oh my God, my Chinese today is horrific. I'm, I'm just about to give up, actually. Sorry. I've talked for five hours previously to this. You can say everyone's names properly for me. But look, Parasite, Parasite is the oldest and most, most active of independent organizations in this part of the region and it has sent, set extraordinary benchmarks over you know, this exceptional history of contributing to the field over 20 years. And I think it's you know, fair to say that it's always a complicated landscape for the independent organizations in the Asia Pacific region and maintaining true independence is always a question in terms of the relationships that we have, both with our stakeholders and also our objectives. Um, there was an interesting moment for Parasite in 2013 where they were rejected by the Home Affairs Bureau for funding, as I understand. And um, in 2014, they were actually awarded a springboard grant, which helped to reinvest in the organization and helped in sort of supporting the relocation program for the organization. And, and Cosman has done a remarkable job in his tenure as director in investing in new platforms, but also existing platforms, particularly through the auction and fundraising uh, sort of you know, structures that you had in place to really increase capacity. I was at the Parasite auction last year and it was one of the most remarkable events I've ever seen. The amount of support in the room for your organization from the community here in Hong Kong was humbling and overwhelming and the amount of money that you raised for your organization to invest back in programming was truly exceptional and deserves recognition. So it'd be great for you to talk about the context that you're working in, also how sustainable is that level of generating revenue and the strategies that you've been putting in place. Thank you. Um, I have to apologize for my voice. It has died at some point uh, yesterday. Um, I think the, um, I think the, um, history of structure of support for Parasite uh, over the past years, uh, well, over, the, over its entire existence, in fact, reflects uh, the changing landscape of uh, not only the funding uh, opportunities in Hong Kong, but the, the general um, changes in the, in the cultural landscape. Um, I think Parasite's um, appearance and, 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 and certainly a continuation in its first years would have simply been impossible without uh, a clear government structure, the, the ADC, uh, that uh, allowed it to happen. 
Um, it would, would have been uh, almost impossible to conceive that a non-profit uh, artist-run space as it was in its first years in the late 90s landscape of Hong Kong could have, and, and early 2000s could have continued with a continuous program uh, for all these years uh, without uh, um, uh, um, um, a branch of support in the, in, in the public sector especially designated for that. Um, at some point in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, there was uh, this need to diversify. Uh, there, were, there, there was, a, there was a, a, a private component from the first years, but there was a, a clearer and more committed um, um, idea from the, from the early to mid 2000s that um, the development of, 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 of Parasite, especially as it uh, morphed from an artist-run space into um, a small art center and, and, and a, a curator-led and, and, and and team-led um, kind of institution, uh, so that this kind of transformation uh, required not only the support of 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 of, of the public um, arm, but a mix of support from uh, the private and the public sector as well. Um, I think this. It, this can also be seen as, as, as a fundamental uh, decision that has ensured not only the survival of Parasite over the past two decades, but also its independence in many yeah. So this, this fundamental idea that support needs to be diversified, that support cannot rely on one funder, you know, one company, the government exclusively, one patron or even you know like a small group of patrons the idea that in order to to build this institution one has to um, rely on uh, a multi multiplicity of, of, of supporters and this is of course even more important in a context like Hong Kong which is you know defined by its instability and it's defined by you know the shifting sands of, of uh, of, of all its realities. Um, I would say that also, like if we are to continue this history, um, when Parasite actually moved to uh, a, a higher grade of, of, of support from the government in um, 2000, 2012, uh, essentially, that was also something that allowed us to, um, to, to, to step into a new category of, of a, a new chapter of our existence and it allowed us to sort of lay the basis for an institution that could also consider um, taking its private supports uh, at, a, at a different level. What so, does the government support you? How does, how does the government describe the support that it offers to Parasite and what is Parasite expected to do in return to, for support from government in Hong Kong? Yeah, well, currently we are having the second and, and last um, phase of, of the uh, Springboard Grant, which is a, a, a grant that is offered by the Home Affairs Bureau uh, of the Hong Kong government. It is um, um, only available twice for, for an organization. It's somehow imagined to be supporting mid-sized organizations in, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, one applies with a project, but there is an understanding that that project uh, can be a long term, so it can cover from one to two or, or, or a maximum of three years. Um, so there is a certain degree of flexibility of covering several components of, um, of, of an institution's budget from um, part of, an, well, a minority, but still part of the of structural cost to uh, a majority of it being designated to, to, to certain programs. Um, um, it's interesting because there's a, there's a kind of a transition moment in terms of government support because when, when the springboard was, was uh, put forward as a, as a, as a grant, it, it certainly um, uh, was, was uh, essential to cover an otherwise uh, uncovered ground that of the, the mid-scale institutions in Hong Kong, but it was the only field where the, the grant was only available for a, for a limited amount of time, so this um, um, for, for um, you know, two times, um, because the larger institutions have a, a different schemes of, of, of accessing public funds, and then the smaller organizations have access to uh, the ADC, which doesn't have a, a, a limit in terms of the numbers of times you, you, are, you are allowed to apply. Whereas for a, a mid-sized institution, there was this difficulty. Of, um, currently, there, 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 there's a, a new scheme that is being proposed by the government, which uh, is meant to, to address that. Um, there's a number of other concerns uh, uh, that they're, 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 um, they seem to be in the, 
you know, to, to, to be addressed in this, in this new plan. So uh, there is a certain responsiveness on the, on the part of the government to, to address the situation. And I, I would just add here that it's also it's important, like one of the distinctive features of perhaps of the region is that whereas there is, of course, a, a clear difference in between funding that one gets from the government and private funding, that comes from, let's say, foundations and private funding that comes from individuals and then uh, private funds that you uh, gain from a fundraising auction. So obviously they come with you know, different expectations, but they are in many ways connected, much more so than in other contexts. Um, I, I would say that in a way the kind of development that has happened in the private sector, the, the even Art Basel and the developments in the gallery sectors have probably contributed to a certain extent to um, you know, in, to, to the government strategy of, of understanding that arts is an important, you know, field of, of, of you know, in, in society of investment. Sure. Yeah. So, but that in a way resonated to, you know, simply, in, 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 you know, indirectly to, to determine them to support art, even if it doesn't have a direct, um, you know, commercial purpose or, 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 or some sort of justification in the kind of creative industries uh, logic. So um, there is a certain kind of a, a, um, um, a cross-pollination of, of, of the fields and how they determine each other. And um, I think a lot of like the support, the, 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 you know, private support that one gets from individuals is also in many ways a consequence of, of art simply gaining a, a, a higher preeminence in society in terms of its visibility, so... Um, I suppose a question I would have for you is, five years ago, how much of Parasite's annual um, generated revenue would have been public or government funded and how much would have been self-generated through diversified funding, through philanthropics or private giving or benefaction? How much now and what is your plan for five years forward? Um, so, five years ago, so in 2011, uh, it would have been, um, it would have been actually around 50-50, uh, so 50% uh, government and 50% uh, private. Um, and currently it is about 20% government and 80% private, but both fields have increased significantly, so that also means that um, the overall budget has risen five times. And how sustainable do you feel like the self-generated revenue, the 80% of your budget that's now generated through things like the auction, the fundraiser, how sustainable does the board, do you do a lot of risk analysis as an organization or, or prepare strategies for maintaining that through time? Obviously, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's by definition one of the most unstable um, you know, sources of funding and, and one that is difficult to to you know, uh, um, base your your planning on. I mean, one can say that all the or the organisations that have done uh, that, that use this format in Hong Kong have actually um, been able to meet their their planning at least in the last five years. So, like either the kind of growth that they propose for themselves, or, or the or, or or the plateauing that that they that they propose for themselves. Um, I think there is. Um, you know, a certain degree of of stability that you know it's difficult to 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 have it quaranteed in your pocket, but it's there. You know, I think it's a a, a number of or, or or an amount of money that in other contexts would have um, would have come to to support you as as a private philanthropy manifests itself through the auction. So it's pretty much constant there. Um, um, and do you feel like this? But I think there's also the other issue, you know, of course we're trying, you know, and we're, we're what, we, what we started like two years ago was to aggressively grow a patron program um, that has grown quite beautifully and it's now, you know, something like 10 to 15% of our budget. Um, and it was, it was also an attempt to see like how much of, of, of the, um, uh, instability of the fundraising auction. How much of the budget can from the fundraising auction can move to the to the patron program? Something that is, by definition, more reliable, of course, because there's a basic understanding of re recurrence there. Um, and 
while that has grown and it's an important support for our organization, it, it also has its uh, limitations. But what I wanted to mention here is that, of course, there's a, there's a counter side and, a, and, a, um, and you know, a positive aspect to, 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 to this model. You know, the instability is, to a certain extent, um, compensated by the autonomy that this source of funding gives you as an institution. Mm. Because, of course, there's, you know, it's one of the um, sources of funding that comes with the least um, um, you know, specter of Let's expectations, obligations, obligations <laughs> um, or expectations, or uh, yeah. you know, um, could, could, kind yeah, of I, like control. Uh, I wonder, could, could I make a comment on that? Because I think part of the experience that we're hearing about it is is the effectiveness of leverage, um, and certainly from the perspective of um, the philanthropic sector. You know, the philanthropic sector is wanting to leverage government. The government's wanting to leverage the philanthropic sector. And so there's a, a quite an interesting, you know, symbiotic relationship here. Um, um, it, for example, the, um, uh, within the Australia Council, the funding for, the, for Australia's representation at, at Venice is around about one third funded um, from the Commonwealth government appropriation. And about two thirds of it come from, uh, comes from raising funds from private individuals and from the, the corporate sector. In the building of the new pavilion, I think about six and a half million came from private sources, one million came from, from the uh, um, public, um, from the Australia Council Reserve. So you, you have this situation where, where everyone's sort of thrilling at the chase of leveraging someone else um, uh, in, in, a, in, in an ordered in an ordered way, and that that seems to be part of this sort of multiple multiple sources of funding for the for the sector. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, there's a, there's an impasse certainly, and there's a question of what the threshold is in some of these things. In Australia, in the small to medium sector, the 14 contemporary arts organisations that are surrounded across Australia, the small to medium not for profit sector that was largely established around the 1970s and 80s out of artist run initiatives, similarly to Parasite, and has matured into a professionally structured network. You know, 10 years ago, only 20% of the collective annual turnover of those organizations was self-generated through be benefaction philanthropy or diversification of revenue. Um, two years ago, um, the organizations collectively match dollar for dollar the investment of federal government into their organizations. But there's a problem with phil with philanthropic and private giving. And in Australia, I suppose, and this is a question in the Turkish context, which is that there's this idea that the private sector should be taking on more responsibility for investing infrastructure and operations for organizations. But people largely want to f fund programming or outcomes, and they want to see something that's the more, let's call it the sexy end of business, right? It's, it's the actual programming and content. But how sustainable, how do we invest in making artists sustainable through giving them space, not just to achieve outcomes, but to fail, to create works that aren't just about endpoints? And how can we create stable structures for organizations to invest in risk? Because that leveraging is creating a bit of a crisis point in terms of who's responsible. Is that maybe a quick yeah, comment for you and a quick yeah, comment no, for you? I'll, I'll make, maybe make, make a comment. I mean, I, I really love that expression being funded to fail because it actually suggests that there's bravery uh, and there's courage so taken in the funding decisions and that, uh, you know, if, if you're not actually failing in the sector, you're really not trying hard enough. And, and that's, um, you know, beholden upon, um, uh, upon those of us in the sector to sort of make that point of emphasis and make it a comfortable place to, you know, to have that level of experimentation. I mean, I think the, the point about government funding and it relates to our four-year a funding strategy that uh, we're working through that program at the moment. It was to have been six years, but it, uh, with the changes, it came back to four years. But the, the, the key policy idea behind that is to create some certainty of recurrent funding. And on the basis of the certainty of recurrent funding, the organisations that then receive the four-year funding have the ability to leverage that uh, and, based on that certainty, enter into all sorts of other agreements. The, the thing that, that often is of concern to the philanthropic sector and perhaps more corporates than, than benefactors themselves is they'd actually like the certainty that the organisation will be around for a period of time. Mm. And therefore, four-year funding gives that, uh, gives that sense of certainty in being able to plan, plan forward. The, the vagaries of philanthropic funding, however, are, as you say, Alexi, that they're, they're more often interested in project-based work rather than recurrent funding, um, because that's not really the bag of philanthropics. They're not trying to take over the role of, of, of government in, in, in that regard. They're interested in, in, other, in other things with different so, sorts of, um, uh, of outcomes and ways of measuring, measuring success. I mean, it might be nice, Merva, to hear your thoughts. Um. I mean, because we fundraise annually, 
we cannot um, we cannot fund an institution for four years um, because even though we do trust our network of supporters um, at the same time it's it's annual and people can you know stop supporting Saha um, but at the same time um, we try to support for example the sustainability fund in Turkey for artist initiatives this is really the, the funding the, the right to fail for artists and um, and I think it's very, very important because we, we usually, I mean, 70% of our funding goes outside of Turkey, so to international institutions. Um, but at the same time, we need to invest in a younger generation of artists and give them the right to experiment in smaller spaces. And this is, you're right, I mean, in the private, you know, having private funders, this is not what they expect to see because it, it's not the deliver, what's delivered is not always um, very sexy or, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's not even there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, when you look at who we fund outside, like um, we, we always fund the production of the Venice Biennale, the Pavilion of, of Turkey, and um, when you see that these artists also came out of artist initiatives. And in Turkey, they tend to have a history of dying out because there's no public funding. So I think it's important that we carry on supporting. And we have, our board has been very supportive in um, increasing the funding that we provide for artist initiatives. And, and hearing the feedback from the artistic community in Turkey, um, they understand that it's very important that um, yes, we fund it, um, initiatives that uh, have a program, a consistent program, but at the same time, they may say they will have six exhibitions and five may appear, and you know, it may just not work out. But you know, we invest in the future. This is, it's a, we look at the long run. Okay, with the future as the word there, we have room for maybe two questions. Is there questions from the audience for the panel? Um, is there a microphone with anybody? If there's no questions, are there questions? Yep, I can see a question there. Is it Catherine Kroll? Yes. Great. Um, I'm very interested in the amount of effort and time you spend uh, constructing your board of directors because I think this is an integral part of running your organisation and forward thinking and forward planning and I'd like to hear from each of you how you uh, construct that board of directors to take your organisations forward in these interesting times in which we live. Great question. Thanks, Catherine. Maybe if we go to Cosman first. Yeah, well, um, our board of directors is, um, has for, for a long time now been built um, in a kind of like... Um, mixed way of of, um, of of trying to cover quite different um, aspects of, of 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 the life of an of an organization so uh, from the initial founders to um, um, artists to supporters of the arts uh, to um, other individuals that can help us with the advocacy uh, across several sectors of our um, Activity. So, um, it's a it's quite a diverse uh, group of individuals. How many board directors do you have? <coughs> uh, nine. And are there artists on the board still? There are. Yes. Is that constitutional well. or is it? It is well. It's not written in the in in the status, but it's I guess a strong understanding that that would be a perpetual um, presentation and representation yeah. on the board. <coughs> Great. Merva? Um, well, it, the board of directors at the moment for Saha are still the founders. And, well, we are, I mean, I'm very lucky with, with our board because they, they're, um, they had the vision to, to establish Saha. So they are very committed. Um, they're very open to change. Um, they all come from different backgrounds also. Not all of them are even collectors. Um, some of them are stronger in the philanthropy side, so they support uh, education. Like there, there are people who support education, theater. Um, there's, I mean, the, the majority of them are businessmen and businesswomen, so um, it's, um, it leads us to be uh, more strategic and um, do planning and um, 
and be, uh, I mean, it's operating a fund, so it's very important. Um, but in terms of change, I think it's very important that we, we, we set up the rules of, of the change of the director, I mean, board of directors, because it's, as I said, it's collective and anybody can become a board member, but we said that um, the, a set of rules, so it will be a slow change, a, a controlled change, and the principles will remain, and every, um, in, in two years time, we will have another um, election, and it will only be two or three members change, so we transfer the knowledge. This is very important. Is it generational, your board? Are the board directors generally around the same generation or age, or are they representing a diversity of generations? Diversity of generations, um, diversity of, I mean, Expertise. half and half between male and female. That's good. Um, yeah. Do you do strategic planning very often with your board to think about the objectives of Saha and to monitor how you're investing? Um, yeah. Yeah. Very, 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 I mean, every board meeting. Um, we have to look at the figures, for example. I mean, our budget is, you know, planning our budget is very important. Strategic planning and the vision is very important. We try to, we don't, we, we're very open to critique. We actually encourage critique of the institution um, so that we can adapt. How does that come into you? Through artists, because every project that we have are applied for, um, the first rule for our funding is that they ask the artist or the person involved whether they would accept that we fund. And this works in two ways. One is, is of course, they may not accept. Um, and this is the ethics. And secondly, it's because um, also quite recently in the past six months or a year, um, we have had artists um, say, don't support this project because I don't need the funding in this one. So they, they save the money, you know, as, as it's their own, and which, which it is. Mm. Um, so we, we, because we are so close to the community of artists and the artistic community, we exist for them, uh, we, we get the critique. I think, yeah, that reciprocity and that bilateral kind of nature of the structure that you're putting in place through that generosity of exchange with those that you fund, not as kind of recipients, but as collaborators is quite important. And yeah. in that tone, I suppose it's interesting to think about the board of the Australia Council and how that's working. Yeah. So we've got a board of 12. Um, 50% are currently artists or have been um, artists, 50% um, men and women. Um, the, the role of the board is, is a skills-based board now in contrast to the way it was a couple of years ago where membership of the board actually required, where it was made up of the, the representative chairs of the respective art form boards which then were visual arts and, and uh, dance and literature, literature. And, and so forth. So the, 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 the broad, the broad skills-based nature of the, of the board means that uh, you know, those skills are brought to, to bear. It's more of a strategic board than an operating board in that sense. It's not a board of management. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the work of the um, grant making is done um, through the, the peer structure that I referred to earlier. Um, but the, the actual um, uh, appointments are all government, government appointments um, with, uh, in consultation with, uh, with the chair of the council. It's interesting. I mean, that, that leads to a particular conversation, but I think our conversation is just about finished. I could talk about strategic planning all day long, but uh, we haven't got that luxury, unfortunately, here today. But I would really just like to thank Rupert Meyer, who has demonstrated an extraordinary amount of leadership over the past 20 years in Australia. I'd like to acknowledge Saha and Merva for her time today. What Saha is doing Ladies in a way... Ladies and gentlemen, oh. please be reminded to take care around the artworks. Thank you. That's oh, Take great care around the funding too. I would just say, Merva, artists always speak so highly of Saha, and that is a really important thing. And to Cosman, I would thank you so much today for your time and for speaking so frankly about the Hong Kong context. And I do apologize for mangling with my very poor Chinese today, the names of the founders for whom I have a great deal of respect, of course. But look, thank you to the three of you for the work that you are doing around advocacy and support and collegiality for the sector throughout the region. Please give the speakers a round of applause.